How about them soft closed hinges, huh? They're pretty smooth. Hey, look, here comes our first aid provider. Hey, April, how's your training go? Oh, good. Actually, better than I thought. A lot of things have changed, though. Hope I never have to use it. Yeah, especially on me. <laughs> well, I'm gonna go ban these shells. I'll see you guys All later. All right, we'll see you. Well, I'm glad you're here. Thanks. Oh, shoot. I'm late for the production meeting. I'll see you. Accidents and emergencies happen anywhere and anytime. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, there are hundreds of millions of emergency department visits for injuries and illnesses in the United States every year. Safe practices at work, home, and play can prevent many injuries, illnesses, and deaths. However, once an injury or sudden illness has occurred, Effective first aid can often improve recovery and even prevent permanent disability or death. First aid is the initial care provided for an acute illness or injury when advanced care procedures are not readily available. A first aid provider is someone trained to recognize, assess, and prioritize the need for first aid. Provide appropriate first aid care recognize limitations, and seek professional medical assistance when necessary. Andy? Andy, are you okay? Andy? Before helping as a trained first aid provider, you must be able to recognize that a medical emergency exists. Often, emergency situations are unexpected events and can be confusing. A general impression is a quick sense of what has occurred or is occurring when you first observe an emergency scene. This impression can provide important clues to help guide you as you continue. Where is the person located? How is the person's body positioned? Does the person look sick or injured? Is it safe for me to be here? Does the person appear to be unconscious? A person who is not moving and appears to have collapsed could have experienced a sudden cardiac arrest. You could be the person's only chance for survival. Call EMS and get the AED. If you suspect an injury, how do you think it happened? Injuries occur due to physical force against the body. The manner in which that force creates an injury is called the mechanism of injury. Mechanisms that transfer significant force are best assumed to result in serious injury until proven otherwise. Emergency scenes are often unsafe. Your personal safety is the highest priority, even before the safety of an ill or injured person. Putting yourself in danger to help someone can make the situation worse. Always pause for a moment before approaching. Look for obvious hazards consider the possibility of hidden dangers. If the scene is unsafe, do not approach. If your current location becomes unsafe, get out. One of the most difficult decisions to make is whether or not to get involved when you think a medical emergency has occurred. It is normal to feel hesitant about your ability to help. You might hesitate because you feel like the problem is too big for you to handle alone. You are only the first link in a progressive chain of emergency care. Your involvement lasts only until relieved by another first aid provider or responding EMS personnel. In most cases, a very short period of time. You might hesitate for fear of making things worse. Your training provides you with sound knowledge and skills designed only to help and not harm those in need. You might also hesitate because you think you don't have a lot of medical knowledge. Extensive medical knowledge is not necessary. First aid is simple and easy to provide. Finally, you might hesitate because there are others around who you think might take charge. In fact, others may feel the same way, resulting in no one stepping forward to help. If it is safe to do so, take action. Your actions can help protect or save a life. When caring for someone, you can be exposed to blood or other potentially infectious body fluids. While the risk of contracting a disease is very low, it is wise to take simple measures to avoid exposure in the first place. 
Infectious blood-borne diseases include hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV, the virus that causes AIDS. Exposure can occur through direct contact of infectious material with an open wound or sore, or absorbed through the membranes of the mouth, nose, and eyes. Exposure can also occur through a skin puncture with a contaminated sharp object. Reducing exposure lowers the chance of infection. Standard precautions is a set of protective practices used whether or not an infection is suspected. To be effective, your approach is the same for everyone, regardless of the relationship or age. Personal Protective Equipment, or PPE, describes protective barriers worn to prevent exposure to infectious diseases. Disposable gloves are the most commonly used protective barrier. Make sure they are readily available and always use them. Inspect gloves for damage or tears when you put them on. If damaged, replace them immediately. After providing care, always remove contaminated gloves carefully. Avoiding bare skin, pinch the glove at either palm with the gloved fingers of the opposite hand. Gently pull the glove away from the palm and toward the fingers, turning the glove inside out without snapping. Gather the glove you just removed with your gloved hand. Carefully slide your bare index finger inside the wristband of the gloved hand. Gently pull outwards and down, inverting the glove and trapping the first glove inside. Throw away gloves in an appropriate container to prevent any further contact. Even after using gloves, use soap and water to clean your hands or any exposed skin. Use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer if soap and water are not available. Another commonly used PPE, a face shield, can be used to prevent mouth, nose, and eye exposure when there is a possibility of splashing or spraying. Everyone has the right to refuse medical treatment. Always ask a responsive person if he or she wants help before providing care. Andy, it's April. I'm here to help you, okay? Just be still while I take a look around. Okay. When a person is unresponsive, the legal concept of implied consent assumes a person would agree to be helped given the circumstances. If you're alone and unable to use a mobile phone, you may need to leave to get additional help, in which case, return to the person as soon as you can. EMS is on the way. I'm going to sit with you until I get here, okay? Some people fear being sued as a result of incorrectly performing first aid in an emergency. In almost every case, this fear is unwarranted. All states have passed what are known as Good Samaritan laws to encourage bystanders to assist those in need. These laws help protect anyone who voluntarily provides assistance without expecting or accepting compensation, is reasonable and prudent, does not provide care beyond the training received, and is not grossly negligent or completely careless in delivering emergency care. Good Samaritan laws vary from state to state. Become familiar with the laws in your state and other states where you work or travel. Regardless of location, it is always appropriate to use common sense. Activate EMS or an Occupational Emergency Action Plan, or EAP, immediately. If the scene is unsafe, do not enter. Ask a responsive person for permission before giving care. Never attempt skills that exceed your training. And once you have started, don't stop until someone with equal or greater training relieves you. Okay. Here's the first aid kit. I saw what happened, can I help? Yes, can you activate the emergency action plan? Sure. Control, this is Brian in the cabinet shop. We have an employee here. An essential role of the first aid provider is recognizing when additional help is needed and knowing how to call for it. This includes learning how and when to activate the EMS system, using the emergency action plan in your workplace, and how to contact your local poison control center. Emergency Medical Services, or EMS, describes the pre-hospital emergency medical response system developed within a community. 
An EMS system uses specialized emergency communication equipment to gather information and dispatch appropriate emergency resources. Trained EMS providers within the system respond directly to emergency scenes, provide advanced medical care, and transport ill or injured people to a hospital. Activating the EMS system usually consists of calling an easy to remember emergency number, such as 911. This is appropriate when there are immediate threats to life, a significant mechanism of injury has occurred, warning signs of serious illness exist, or if you are unsure about the severity of a person's condition. When you make a phone call to activate EMS, a trained dispatcher will guide you through the call. EMS dispatchers may also be trained to guide you in the care you provide, especially with CPR. The dispatcher will ask for basic information, such as the type of emergency, location, and what care is being provided. Answer questions as clearly and concisely as you can. Appropriate resources will be notified to respond while you are on the line. The majority of emergency calls in the U.S. are now made on mobile phones. With a mobile phone, you can quickly activate EMS while staying in place next to the affected person. The speaker function of a phone allows you to listen to the dispatcher and provide care at the same time. An emergency action plan is used to help ensure safe and healthy conditions at work. It provides step-by-step -step procedures on how to report and respond to emergencies. Emergency action plans take into account the specific layout, size, and features of a particular worksite. Activating an emergency action plan may be as simple as dialing 911, or it may be more involved, such as notifying a centralized communications person or activating an in-house emergency team. Make sure you understand your emergency action plan so that you know how to report and respond to emergencies at work. Poison control centers offer free, confidential medical advice 24 hours a day, seven days a week, through the National Poison Helpline at 1-800-222-1222. This service provides a primary resource for poisoning information and care for suspected poisonings. It is best not to move an ill or injured person at all unless he is clearly endangered or requires life-supporting care. The greatest concern in moving a seriously injured person is the chance of making existing problems, such as a spinal injury, worse. If you decide it is necessary to move someone, the most effective move to use is a drag. When using a drag, pull in the direction of the long axis of the body to keep the spine in line. Never pull on a person's head or pull a person's body sideways. When moving someone, use your legs, not your back, and keep him as close to your body as possible. Avoid twisting. Consider the person's weight. Know your physical ability and respect your limitations. Common drags include the extremity drag performed by grasping and pulling on the ankles or forearms, the clothing drag performed by pulling on a person's shirt in the neck and shoulder area, and the blanket drag, performed by rolling a person onto a blanket and dragging the blanket. The goal of your training is to help you gain knowledge, skills, and confidence necessary to effectively manage a medical emergency until more advanced help is available. First aid is easy to learn, remember, and perform. Because the human body cannot store oxygen, it must continually supply tissues and cells with oxygen through the combined actions of the respiratory and circulatory systems. The respiratory system includes the lungs and the airway, the passage from the mouth and nose to the lungs. Expansion of the chest during breathing causes suction, which pulls outside air containing oxygen through the airway and into the lungs. Relaxation of the chest increases the pressure within and forces used air to be exhaled from the lungs. The circulatory system includes the heart and a body-wide network of blood vessels. Electrical impulses stimulate contractions of the heart to create pressure that pushes blood throughout the body. 
Blood vessels in the lungs absorb oxygen from inhaled air. The oxygen-rich blood goes to the heart, then out to the rest of the body. Large vessels, called arteries, carry oxygenated blood away from the heart. Arteries branch down into very small vessels that allow oxygen to be absorbed directly into body cells so it can be used for energy production. Veins return oxygen-poor blood back to the heart and lungs, where the cycle repeats. The brain is especially sensitive to a lack of oxygen. When oxygen is cut off to the brain, brain cell damage and death can occur within a matter of minutes. Hey, Christy, how are you? Pretty good, thanks. Hey, Christy. Buddy. Hey, Jim, we're due in the training room in a few minutes. Are you ready? Wow, I did not realize the time. Here you go. Thanks. Thanks for coming and getting me. <laughs> no worries. I'd be right there with you if Bodhi here hadn't come and got me. <laughs> yeah, a common occurrence. I do it because it makes you feel important. Cardiac arrest is the loss of the heart's ability to pump blood to the body. The most dramatic occurrence, sudden cardiac arrest, can happen with little or no warning. Victims abruptly become unresponsive and collapse. Abnormal gasping can occur. Breathing may stop completely. The most likely cause of sudden cardiac arrest is an unexpected disruption to the heart's electrical system in which normally organized electrical pulses within the heart become disorganized and a chaotic quivering condition known as ventricular fibrillation occurs. Blood flow to the body, along with the oxygen it carries, stops. Without blood flow, brain damage occurs rapidly and quickly leads to death. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation, or CPR, is the immediate treatment for a suspected cardiac arrest. CPR allows a bystander to restore limited oxygen to the brain through a combination of chest compressions and rescue breaths. However, CPR alone is not enough. The most effective way to end fibrillation is defibrillation using a defibrillator and electrode pads applied to the chest. A controlled electric shock is sent through the heart to stop ventricular fibrillation, allowing the heart's normal electrical activity to return and restore blood flow. Successful defibrillation is highly dependent on how quickly defibrillation occurs. For each minute in cardiac arrest, the chance of surviving goes down by about 10%. After as few as 10 minutes, survival is unlikely. Simply activating EMS will not help. Even in the best EMS systems, the amount of time it takes from recognition of the arrest to EMS arriving at the site of the victim is usually longer than 10 minutes. An automated external defibrillator, or AED, is a small, portable, computerized device that is simple for anyone to operate. Bystander use of AEDs has been growing steadily, with common placements of the devices in public locations, such as airports and hotels, and workplaces in general. Turning on an AED is as simple as pushing a power button. Once it is on, an AED provides voice instructions to guide you through its use. Remove clothes from patient's chest. An AED automatically analyzes the heart rhythm. Analyzing heart rhythm. Determines if a shock is needed and charges itself to be ready to defibrillate. Shock advised. Stay clear. An operator simply pushes a button to deliver the shock when prompted by the AED. Sudden cardiac arrest can strike at any age, but primarily affects adults. The chain of survival is often used to describe the best approach for treating sudden cardiac arrest. Each link in the chain is essential for a person to survive. If a single link is weak or missing, the chances for survival are greatly reduced. The greatest chance for survival exists when all the links are strong. Early recognition of cardiac arrest and activation of EMS. Immediate CPR with high quality chest compressions. 
rapid defibrillation, or electrical shock to the heart. Effective basic and advanced EMS care and transport, and effective post-cardiac arrest care at a hospital. Unlike sudden cardiac arrest, in which the heart is the primary problem, cardiac arrest can also be the end result of the loss of an airway or breathing. This is secondary cardiac arrest. Problems such as hazardous breathing conditions in a confined space, drowning, and drug overdoses can result in secondary cardiac arrest. With no incoming oxygen, the heart progressively becomes weaker until signs of life become difficult or impossible to assess. If the heart is simply too weak to create obvious signs of life, immediate CPR, with an emphasis on effective rescue breaths, may be the only chance to restore them. The abuse of opioid drug is serious and a growing health problem. Increasing prescriptions for opioid pain relievers have made them more commonly available. The use of heroin is also contributing to the problem. As a result, overdoses and deaths from prescription opioids and heroin have risen dramatically. Opioids taken in excess can depress and stop breathing. Opioid overdose is a clear cause of secondary cardiac arrest. Naloxone, also known as Narcan, is a medication that can temporarily reverse the life-threatening effects of opioids. It is easy to administer, either through an auto-injector device or through an aerosol that is sprayed into the nose. Naloxone is becoming more readily available to lay providers. It is reasonable to provide education and training on responding to suspected opioid overdoses, including the administration of naloxone to those most likely to be involved with this type of emergency. Laws regarding first aid administration of naloxone vary by city and state. As with Good Samaritan laws, know the laws in your area. Children are more likely to experience a secondary cardiac arrest instead of a primary one. This is an important consideration in how you approach a child or infant you think may have arrested. When describing age groups in relation to CPR, an infant is younger than one year of age. A child is one year of age until the onset of puberty. Puberty can be identified by breast development in females and the presence of armpit hair in males. The chain of survival for children includes the following links. Prevention of airway and breathing emergencies. Early CPR with an emphasis on effective rescue breaths and if needed, defibrillation with an AED. Prompt activation of EMS. Effective basic and advanced EMS care and transport and effective post-cardiac arrest care at a hospital. There are a set of basic CPR skills used to provide the most effective approach to cardiac arrest. External compression of the chest increases pressure inside the chest and directly compresses the heart, forcing blood to move from the chest to the lungs, brain, and the rest of the body. To perform effective compressions, the affected person needs to be positioned on his or her back on a flat, firm surface. Kneel close to the side of the person. Place the heel of one hand on the center of the chest, on the lower half of the breastbone. Place the heel of your other hand on top of and parallel to the first. You can interlace your fingers to help keep them off the chest. Bring your body up and over the chest so your shoulders are directly above your hands. Straighten your arms and lock your elbows. Bending at the waist, use your upper body weight to push straight down to a depth of at least two inches. Lift your hands and allow the chest to fully return to its normal position. Move immediately into the downstroke of the next compression. Continue compressions at a rate between 100 and 120 times per minute. Quality matters. The better you compress, the greater the influence on survival. Focus on high quality techniques. Compress deeply, more than two inches. It is likely you will not compress deep enough. While injury could occur from deeper compressions, do not let the fear of this affect compression depth. Allow the chest wall to fully recoil or rebound between compressions. Avoid leaning at the top of each compression. 
Compress fast between 100 and 120 times a minute. Do not let a higher compression speed result in shallower compression depth. When compressing properly, you may hear and feel changes in the chest wall. This is normal. Forceful external chest compressions may cause chest injury, but are critical if the person is to survive. The compression technique for children is similar to that of adults. To perform chest compressions on a child, position the child face up on a flat, firm surface. Place the heel of one hand on the lower half of the breastbone, just above the point where the ribs meet. Using upper body weight, compress at least one third the full depth of the chest, or about two inches. Lift your hand and allow the chest to fully return to its normal position. Without pausing, continue into the downstroke of the next compression. Continue compressing at a rate between 100 and 120 times per minute. Avoid leaning. Without losing contact, allow the chest to fully rebound at the top of each compression. Compressions can be tiring. If you need to, use two hands to perform compressions on a child. To perform chest compressions on an infant, position the infant face up on a flat, firm surface. Place two fingertips on the breastbone just below the nipple line. Compress at least one third the full depth of the infant's chest, or about one and a half inches. Lift your fingers and allow the chest to fully return to its normal position. Without pausing, continue into the downstroke of the next compression. Continue compressing at a rate between 100 and 120 times per minute. Allow the chest to fully rebound at the top of each compression. Rescue breaths are artificial breaths given to someone who is not breathing. They are given by blowing air into the mouth to inflate the lungs. The air you breathe contains about 21% oxygen. Your exhaled air still contains between 16 and 17% oxygen. This exhaled oxygen is enough to support someone's life. To give rescue breaths, you need to make sure there is an open airway. The airway is the only path for getting air into the lungs. Someone who is unresponsive can lose muscle tone. If flat or on his or her back, the base of the tongue can relax and obstruct the airway. This is the most common cause of a blocked airway. The tongue is attached to the lower jaw. Lifting the jaw forward while keeping the mouth open pulls the tongue away from the back of the throat and opens the airway. You can open a person's airway by using the head tilt chin lift technique. Place one hand on the forehead. Place the fingertips of your other hand under the bony part of the chin. Apply firm backward pressure on the forehead while lifting the chin upward. This will tilt the head back and move the jaw forward. Avoid pressing into the soft tissue of the chin with your fingers, as this can also obstruct the airway. Leave the mouth slightly open. As a trained provider, you should use a protective barrier such as a CPR mask or shield when giving rescue breaths to minimize your exposure to infectious disease. Before using a mask, Quickly inspect it to make sure the one-way valve is in place. Place the mask flat on the person's face. Use your thumb and forefinger to provide uniform pressure around the top of the mask. Use the thumb of your hand lifting the chin to control the bottom. Tilt the head and lift the chin to open the airway. Lift the face up into the mask to create an airtight seal. Blow through the valve opening to deliver breaths. Each breath should be about one second in length and have only enough air to create a visible rise of the chest, but no more. Additional air is unnecessary. During CPR, two rescue breaths are given at a time. Provide these as quickly as you can in less than 10 seconds. Take a regular breath before delivering the second rescue breath. If you remove your hands from the head, the airway will close again. It is necessary to open the airway each time you give rescue breaths. If you cannot get the chest to rise with a breath, reposition the head further back by using head tilt, chin lift again, and try another breath. 
to give rescue breaths using an overlay shield. Begin by placing the breathing port of the shield between the teeth and into the person's mouth. Tilt the head and lift the chin to open the airway. Seal the nose by pinching the nostrils closed over or under the shield. Take a normal breath. Open your mouth wide and press your mouth on the shield around the person's mouth to create an airtight seal. Blow through the port to deliver the breath. Each breath should be one second in length and have only enough air to create a visible rise of the chest, but no more. Take a fresh breath before delivering another rescue breath. The same technique can be used to provide mouth-to-mouth -mouth rescue breaths if you elect to not use a barrier device. Rescue breaths for children and infants are performed in the same manner as for adults. Special care should be taken to not give too much air in a single breath. Provide only enough air to make the chest visibly rise, but no more. When using an adult CPR mask to give rescue breaths to an infant, consider rotating the mask 180 degrees to get a better seal. When using a shield or giving mouth-to-mouth -mouth rescue breaths, cover both the infant's mouth and nose with your mouth. AEDs are designed to be simple to use. Voice, lights, and screen instructions guide a user in operating the device. Remove clothes from patient's chest. There are many different brands of AEDs, but the same basic steps for operation apply to all. Opening the lid will turn on the power for some AEDs. With others, simply press the power button. This starts voice instructions and readies the device for use. Apply pads to patient's bare chest. Pads must be applied to a bare chest. If needed, quickly tear away or use scissors to remove all clothing from the torso. For a woman, remove the bra to provide better access for pad placement. Locate and pull out the defibrillation pads. The pads have pictures on them to show proper placement. Proper placement will assure that the pads are able to direct the electrical shock through the heart. Peel the pads from the backing sheet one at a time and place them as shown in the pictures. Place one pad below the right collarbone, above the nipple, and beside the breastbone. Make sure it adheres well by pressing it flat. Place the other pad lower on the left side, over the ribs, and a few inches below the armpit. Again, press firmly. Stay clear of patient. Analyzing. An AED automatically starts analyzing once the pads are in place. Stop CPR. Movement can interrupt the analysis. Be certain that no one is touching the person. Shock advised. If defibrillation is advised, the AED will begin to charge for shock delivery. Quickly look to make sure no one is in contact with the person before delivering the shock. Now, shock delivered. Once delivered, Immediately resume CPR, starting with chest compressions. Analyzing AEDs are also designed to detect problems no during use advised. and guide you through corrective actions. Replace battery immediately. Be sure. If a troubleshooting message occurs at any time, stay calm and follow the AED's voice instructions. Cardiac arrests involving children are likely caused by the initial loss of the airway or breathing. High quality CPR with effective rescue breaths may be the only treatment required for successful resuscitation. However, conditions can occur for which defibrillation of a child or infant is warranted. The steps for using an AED on a child or infant are the same as for an adult. Most AEDs have specially designed pads or mechanisms available that reduce the defibrillation energy to a level more appropriate for a smaller body size. For smaller chests, place one pad on the center of the chest just below the collarbones. Attach the second pad on the center of the back between the shoulder blades. Follow the AED's voice instructions to provide the appropriate care. If an AED specifically equipped for use on a child or infant is not available, 
an AED configured for an adult can be used instead. The primary assessment is a simple way to quickly identify if a life-threatening condition is present. It is the initial approach to anyone suspected of being ill or injured. If it is safe to do so, begin by checking for responsiveness. Tap or squeeze the shoulder and ask loudly, are you all right? If unresponsive, have a bystander activate EMS and get an AED. If you are alone, immediately alert EMS and get an AED yourself. Quickly return to the person. If you have a mobile phone, use it to activate EMS. The speaker function will allow you to follow instructions from an EMS dispatcher while providing care. Quickly look at the face and chest for normal breathing. Weak, irregular, gasping, snorting, or gurgling sounds can occur early in cardiac arrest. <sighs> These actions provide no usable oxygen. This is not normal breathing. Take no longer than 10 seconds. If you are unsure, assume breathing is not normal. If the person is not breathing or only gasping, perform CPR beginning with compressions. If the person is breathing normally and uninjured, place her in a side lying recovery position. The recovery position helps protect the airway by using gravity to drain fluids from the mouth and keeping the tongue from blocking the airway. Place the arm nearest you up alongside the head. Bring the far arm across the chest and... Place the back of the hand against the cheek. Grasp the far leg just above the knee and pull it up so the foot is flat on the ground. Grasping the shoulder and hip, roll the person toward you in a single motion, keeping the head, shoulders, and body from twisting. Make sure the head ends up resting on the extended arm and roll far enough for the face to be angled towards the ground. Make sure there is no pressure on the chest that might restrict breathing. Frequently assess the breathing of anyone placed in a recovery position. The condition can quickly become worse and require additional care. Always perform a primary assessment anytime you suspect someone is ill or has been injured to quickly determine the need for CPR. I'm Belinda, the event coordinator. How's everything going today? Everything is great. Wonderful. Just let any one of us know if you need anything, okay? I will. Thanks. <laughs> you should have seen it. It was very funny. <laughs> and for once, we came early. <laughs> Ma'am, I work for the venue. I can help. Please help him. Let's roll him over. Sir, can you hear me? Sir! Sammy, this is Belinda. A guest collapsed in the event room. Please send the AED up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty
folks. Remove clothes Just follow me. from patient's Let's chest. Let's give them some room to work. Look carefully at the pictures one, on the two, white three, adhesive four, pads. Five, Peel six, one white seven, pad eight, from nine, the gray case. Ten, 11, 12, Place 13, pad 14, 14, exactly as shown. 17, 18, 19, 20, when the first 22, pad is in place, 24, 25, peel 26, the second 26, pad. 29, 30. Stay clear of patient. Analyzing heart rhythm. Stay clear of patient. Analyzing heart rhythm. Shock advised. Stay clear of patient. Are you clear? Press the flashing orange button now. Shock delivered. Immediate high-quality CPR and defibrillation with an AED from a bystander can double or even triple the chance for survival from sudden cardiac arrest. Before anything else, pause and assess the scene for hazards. If the situation is dangerous to you, do not approach. If it is safe, quickly assess for responsiveness. If unresponsive, activate EMS and send someone to get an AED. Check for normal breathing. Do not be fooled by gasping actions. If not breathing or only gasping, begin compressions at 100 to 120 times per minute. Remember that quality matters. Push hard and push fast. Do not lean on the chest. After 30 compressions, give two rescue breaths. Establish an airway first and give only enough air to see the chest rise but no more. Do this quickly in less than 10 seconds. Return to compressions and perform ongoing CPR cycles of 30 compressions and two rescue breaths. Compress hard and fast. Allow the chest to fully recoil to its normal position after each compression. Use the AED immediately when it arrives. Turn on the AED and adhere the defibrillation pads to the bare chest. Stay clear of patient. Analyzing. Allow the AED to Stay analyze the heart. Shock advised. Stay if a shock is advised, make Stay sure you are not touching now. the person before delivering the shock. Shock delivered. Immediately after the shock is delivered, Resume CPR cycles of 30 compressions and two rescue breaths. Voice instructions and additional analysis by the AED will guide you through further care. Don't stop until the person shows signs of life, another provider or EMS personnel take over, or you are too exhausted to continue. If a person clearly responds, stop CPR and place the person in the recovery position. Leave the AED on and attached in case cardiac arrest returns. If a shock is not indicated by the AED, immediately resume CPR. Continue to follow the AED's instructions. Blood pressure is created and maintained with ongoing compressions. When compressions stop, pressure is quickly lost and has to be built up again. Avoid interruptions to maintain high quality CPR. Performing effective chest compressions is tiring. When others can help, take turns performing CPR. Quickly switch compressions every few minutes. When possible, do this during the automatic AED analysis that occurs every two minutes. Do the best you can. A person without breathing or circulation will not survive without help. Nothing you can do can make the outcome worse. Compression-only CPR is an approach that is being widely promoted to people who are not trained in CPR. Simple instructions in compression-only CPR can be shared in many different ways, including social media and as public service announcements. EMS dispatchers can also provide compression-only instructions during an emergency call. However, compression-only CPR is a limited approach. At some point, Rescue breaths are essential for all cardiac arrests, especially those involving an airway or breathing problem, or those involving children. As a trained provider, perform both compressions and breaths during CPR. 
If you are unable or unwilling to perform rescue breaths, you should provide high quality, uninterrupted compressions at a minimum. Performing CPR on a child is similar to performing CPR on an adult. If it is safe for you to approach, do so. Check for responsiveness. If unresponsive, have a bystander activate EMS and get an AED. If alone, continue for two minutes before doing it yourself. Quickly look for normal breathing. If the child is not breathing or only gasping, begin CPR. Locate the proper hand position and start compressing the chest at a rate of 100 to 120 times per minute. After 30 compressions, provide two rescue breaths. Take no longer than 10 seconds to do so. Quickly return to chest compressions. Without interruption, perform continuous cycles of 30 compressions and two rescue breaths. Compress hard and fast. Allow the chest to fully recoil to its normal position after each compression. Continue CPR until an AED is ready, another provider or EMS personnel take over, or you are too exhausted to continue. The steps for infant CPR are very similar to adult and child CPR. If it is safe for you to approach, do so. Tap the infant's foot. Yell loudly. If unresponsive, have a bystander activate EMS, and if available, get an AED. If alone, continue for two minutes before doing it yourself. Quickly look for normal breathing. If the infant is not breathing or only gasping, begin CPR. Locate the proper finger position and start compressing the chest at a rate of 100 to 120 times per minute. After 30 compressions, provide two rescue breaths. Take no longer than 10 seconds to do so. Quickly return to chest compressions. Without interruption, perform continuous cycles of 30 compressions and two rescue breaths. Compress hard and fast and allow the chest to fully recoil to its normal position after each compression. Continue CPR until an AED is ready, another provider or EMS personnel take over, or you are too exhausted to continue. Commonly, more than one trained provider is available to help when a cardiac arrest occurs. Providers can work together to improve performance and reduce interruptions. CPR is tiring, and switching providers every few minutes helps to maintain CPR quality. Communicate about the switch ahead of time. Coordinate your actions to switch smoothly and minimize interruption time. Prior to the arrival of an AED, switch at the end of a CPR cycle, while the person who is going to move out is giving rescue breaths. The new provider can get into position to start compressions immediately. If another person is available to operate the AED, do not stop CPR. Continue compressions as best you can until the AED is ready to analyze the heart rhythm. When an AED is attached, switch during the CPR pause as the AED analyzes the heart. This occurs every few minutes. The new CPR provider gets into position to perform compressions and the new AED operator gets in place to deliver a shock if advised by the AED. After a shock is delivered or no shock is indicated, immediately start compressions. When more than two providers are present, rotate extra providers as the new CPR provider. Choking can occur when a solid object, such as a piece of food or a small object, enters a narrowed part of the airway and becomes stuck. On inhalation, the object can be drawn tighter into the airway and block air from entering the lungs. 
a forceful thrust beneath the ribs and up into the diaphragm can pressurize the air in the chest and pop an obstruction out of the airway. Compression of the chest over the breastbone can also create enough pressure to expel an object. To provide the appropriate care, you must first be able to recognize the difference between a mild blockage and a severe blockage. With a mild blockage, a person can speak, cough, or gag. This type of blockage is typically cleared naturally through forceful coughing. Allow someone with a mild blockage to try and resolve the problem on his own. Stay close and be ready to take action if things worsen. Three-day weekend coming up. You have big plans? Yeah, we're thinking about heading up the lake for a little R&R. &R. Hey, Malcolm, what about you? Johnny. Johnny, what's wrong? Are you choking? When a severe blockage occurs, a person cannot take in enough air to dislodge the object. Signs of severe obstruction include very little or no air exchange, the lack of sound, and the inability to speak or cough forcefully. A person without any air exchange requires your help to survive. The person may hold his hands to his throat while attempting to clear the obstruction. If you suspect someone is choking, ask, are you choking? If the person nods yes, act quickly. Stand behind the person, reach around and locate the person's navel with your finger. Make a fist with your other hand and place the thumb side against the abdomen just above your finger and below the ribs. Grasp your fist with the other hand. Give a quick inward and upward thrust. Each thrust needs to be given with the intent of expelling the object. Repeat thrusts until the person can breathe normally. If the person becomes unresponsive, carefully lower her to the ground. If not already done, activate EMS. CPR with rescue breaths is the preferred treatment at this point. If you are able, perform continuous compression-only CPR. If it appears the compressions have dislodged something in the person's airway, look in the mouth. Remove any object if seen. Continue compression-only CPR until the person shows obvious signs of life or another provider or EMS personnel take over. When someone is clearly pregnant or obese, use chest thrusts instead of abdominal thrusts. Position yourself directly behind the person. Reach under the armpits and place the thumb side of your fist on the center of the chest. Grasp your fist with the other hand and thrust straight backward. If you are choking and alone, try pressing your abdomen quickly against a rigid surface, such as falling onto the back of a chair. If one is not available, attempt abdominal thrusts on yourself. Young children are particularly at risk for choking because of the small size of their air passages, inexperience with chewing, and a natural tendency to put objects in their mouths. For a choking child, the approach is nearly the same as for adults. It might be easier to kneel behind a choking child to deliver thrusts. Use less force on your thrusts. If the child becomes unresponsive, gently get her to the ground have someone activate EMS and begin CPR. Look in the mouth for an object after each set of compressions before giving rescue breaths. Remove any object if seen. If you are alone, continue CPR for about two minutes before activating EMS yourself. Since infants do not speak, it may be more difficult to recognize choking. A sudden onset differentiates it from other breathing emergencies. Signs include weak, ineffective coughs and the lack of sound, even when an infant is clearly attempting to breathe. If you suspect an infant is choking, act quickly. If available, have a bystander activate EMS. Lay the infant face down over your forearm with legs straddled and with the head lower than the chest. Support the head by holding the jaw. Using the heel of your other hand, give five back blows between the shoulder blades. Next, sandwich the infant between your forearms and turn her onto her back with legs and arms straddling your other arm. 
place two fingers on the breastbone just below the nipple line and give five chest thrusts. Repeat back blows and chest thrusts until the infant can breathe normally. If the infant becomes unresponsive, gently place him or her onto a firm surface, have someone activate EMS, and begin CPR. Look in the mouth for an object after each set of compressions prior to giving rescue breaths. Remove any object if seen. If you are alone, continue CPR for about two minutes before activating EMS yourself. The primary assessment remains the same for a responsive person. Look for any immediately life-threatening problems. If it is safe to approach, do so. Introduce yourself. Let the person know you are first aid trained and able to help. Assess for any difficulty in breathing. Briefly scan the body for serious bleeding. If found, control it immediately. Look for obvious signs of shock. Check the face or tissue color. Tissue color is different from skin color, which can be a variety of shades and is a result of genetics. Tissue color is the same for everyone and indicates the amount of blood circulating below the skin. Normal tissue color is light pink. Paleness indicates blood loss or shock. A bluish color indicates a lack of oxygen. Depending on skin tone, it may be easier to check tissue color on the palms, fingernails, or inside the lip. Check skin temperature by touching the forehead with your bare wrist. Normal skin feels warm and dry. Cool, wet skin can be an indication of shock. If a life-threatening medical condition is found or suspected, immediately activate EMS and provide any indicated care. Here, use this to put the glass in. I can help. Okay. Let me have a look. Okay, just put pressure on it. Please get me the first aid kit and call EMS. Okay. Bleeding occurs when blood vessels found throughout the body are damaged. Heavy bleeding is likely if a large blood vessel is involved. Arterial bleeding is bright red and will often spurt from a wound. It can be difficult to control due to the pressure created by the heart's contractions. If blood is dark red and flowing steadily, it is likely coming from a damaged vein. Clot-forming fibers naturally collect at a wound site to try and stop bleeding. But heavy bleeding can overwhelm this and prevent clotting from occurring. Bleeding reduces the amount of oxygen that can be delivered to the body. If heavy or uncontrolled, bleeding can quickly become life-threatening. Pressure applied directly to a bleeding site until bleeding stops is the standard method for controlling external bleeding. Activate EMS immediately for any heavy bleeding. Bleeding exposes you, the provider, to potentially infectious body fluids. Always use disposable gloves as a barrier to protect both you and the injured person. When gloves are not available, an improvised barrier, such as a plastic bag, can be used. Using a clean, absorbent pad for dressing, apply firm pressure with your fingers or palm directly on the point of bleeding. If a pad is not available, you can apply direct pressure with just your gloved hand. If blood soaks through the pad, apply another pad, leaving the initial pad in place. Reapply pressure. Once bleeding stops, maintain pressure. Bleeding may restart if pressure is released. A pressure bandage can be used to maintain ongoing pressure and free you to do other things. Wrap a roller gauze or elastic bandage firmly around the injury to hold the dressing in place. Wrap with enough pressure to take over bleeding control. Avoid wrapping the bandage so tightly that the skin beyond the bandage becomes cool to the touch, bluish, or numb. Make sure a finger can be slipped under the bandage once it's applied.
tourniquets utilize a simple binding method around a limb to stop blood flow. Commercially available tourniquets are ready to use and easier to use than improvised one. If direct pressure is unable to control bleeding on a limb, use a tourniquet. A compressing band is snugly placed around a limb a few inches above the open injury. A solid handle connected to the band is twisted to tighten the band until bleeding stops. The handle is secured in place to maintain the constriction. Improvised tourniquets using the same concept can be created with nearby materials, such as triangular bandages and something solid to twist with. Over here. Are you okay? I'm fine, go. A tourniquet can also be considered a primary step to control severe limb bleeding when it is clear direct pressure cannot be applied effectively, such as in a mass casualty event person with large or multiple injuries, a dangerous environment, or for an inaccessible wound. Training in the application of a tourniquet is critical for its effective use. When direct pressure is unable to control bleeding, and the injury is located where a tourniquet cannot be applied, a first aid provider may consider the use of a hemostatic dressing. A hemostatic dressing is a unique dressing impregnated with an agent that speeds up the clotting process. A hemostatic dressing is packed into an open wound and held in place with direct pressure or a pressure bandage. Pressure is maintained until bleeding has stopped. Training is essential to learn the proper application of a hemostatic dressing. Regardless of the type of bleeding or method used to control it, early and effective bleeding control is essential to protect life. Help me get this under the box? Sure. Okay, got it. Can you steady it while I lift? No problem. Great. A significant blow can create injury and bleeding inside the body. This is especially true for blood vessels and organs in the chest and abdomen. Because you cannot clearly see the injury, okay. internal bleeding can be difficult to detect. Signs of shock may be the earliest indication that internal bleeding is occurring. Any serious illness or injury has the potential to cause shock. Shock develops when poor blood flow creates a shortage of oxygen to body tissues. If not treated early, it can get worse and become life-threatening. Early signs can be difficult to detect. A person may simply begin to appear uneasy, restless, or worried. Other, more serious signs can emerge gradually. The person may become hey, confused. That? The skin may become pale, cool, and sweaty. What's going on? I feel well. A person in shock must get to a hospital as quickly as possible. Early recognition, treatment, and activation of EMS are essential for survival. Call EMS and bring me a first aid kit. To limit the effects of shock, help the body maintain adequate oxygen by ensuring an open and clear airway, confirming normal breathing, and controlling any external bleeding. If there is no difficulty in breathing, lay the person flat on the ground. Maintain a normal body temperature Insulate on top and underneath to prevent heat loss. Be careful not to overheat. I'm really thirsty. Give nothing to eat or drink, even if the person asks for it. Not yet. Keep the person as comfortable and calm as possible. Reassess regularly until another provider or EMS take over. Tia! Tia, Chuck needs your help. He fell off the ladder. Really high up there. I can go get the first. 
think it. Yeah. Okay. When the body suffers a significant force, such as from a high fall, serious injury can result, most notably to the spine. Injury to the spinal cord can result in temporary or permanent paralysis. Paralysis of chest muscles could result in the loss of breathing. Serious shock may also occur. Always make sure it is safe to provide care. If you suspect a spinal injury could have occurred, quickly tell the person to Chuck, remain still. Chuck, I can help. Just stay as still as you can. Suspect a spinal injury when there are obvious injuries to the head, neck, or back, or there is numbness, tingling, burning, or a loss of sensation in the arms, hands, legs, or feet. Activate EMS. Thanks. Can you call the EMS? lack of symptoms yeah, of or obvious injury does not Thanks. mean that the spine is not injured. If a significant mechanism of injury occurred, it is best to assume a spinal injury exists. After an initial injury, the movement of damaged spinal bones can result in additional injury to the spinal cord or surrounding tissue. Okay, Chuck, I'm going to help keep your head still until help gets here. Prevent further injury by restricting spinal movement with manual stabilization of the head. To perform spinal motion restriction, get into a comfortable position behind the person. Cup your hands on both sides of the head to manually stabilize it. Minimize any motion of head, neck, and back. Establishing an airway for an unresponsive person is a higher priority than protecting a suspected injury to the spine. Tilt the head and lift the chin when necessary to maintain an open airway or give rescue breaths. When a head, neck, or back injury is suspected, it is best to leave the person in the position found. However, if the airway is threatened, quickly roll the person as needed to clear and protect it. If you need to leave an unresponsive person with a suspected spinal injury alone to get help, place the person in a recovery position to protect the airway before you go. Comfort, calm, and reassure the person. Reassess regularly until another provider or EMS take over. Injury to the brain can occur from a significant blow to the head or by rapid movements of the head that force the brain to bounce around within the skull. Significant swelling or bleeding inside the skull can result in increased pressure that damages delicate brain tissue. Suspect serious brain injury when a blow to the head clearly results in a diminished level of responsiveness. Surgical intervention may be the only treatment. Activate EMS without delay and manually stabilize the head with your hands. Do not attempt to stop the flow of blood or fluid from the ears or nose. If the person has a seizure, protect the head as much as possible and prevent her from bumping into nearby objects. Do not restrain the person tightly and do not place anything in her mouth. Seizures will generally last for just a few minutes. When the seizure stops, reassess regularly until EMS personnel take over. A concussion is a brain injury that generally results in less immediate or obvious signs. Most concussions are temporary and resolve naturally. Hold on. But it is possible for one to progress into a life-threatening okay. condition. Yeah, just give me a sec. Suspect a concussion after a significant blow to the head or body when the affected person is unable to remember what happened just before or after the incident or recall simple facts about it. Are we going to do corner kicks? Uh, that's what we're doing. The person may move clumsily, answer questions slowly, or show a change in mood or personality. Additional signs include looking stunned or dazed, headache, nausea, dizziness, difficulty in balance, and visual problems. Tell you what, let's, let's go have a seat on the bench. 
A first aid provider may be called upon to give advice on whether someone who may have a concussion is okay to return to normal activities. Unfortunately, there is no current concussion evaluation process for use by those trained in first aid. If you suspect a concussion may have occurred, the affected person should be evaluated by a healthcare provider or EMS personnel as soon as possible. Because she was so unsteady and, and still confused after colliding with Emma, I'm concerned. She should be evaluated by a healthcare professional. Okay, I'll take her to urgent care. Because of the potential progressive nature of concussion, it is best to not allow the person to perform actions that could pose a risk for additional injury until she can be adequately assessed by a healthcare professional. Bones, muscles, and joints give the body shape, allow movement, and protect vital internal organs. Long bones form the upper and lower parts of each limb. Muscles, ligaments, and tendons attach to the bones, allowing for movement where the bones come together at joints. These bones are the most exposed to external forces and injury. There are four different types of injuries affecting bones, muscles, and joints. Strains are stretching or tearing injuries to muscles or tendons. Sprains are tearing injuries to ligaments that hold joints together. Dislocations are the separation of bone ends at a joint. And fractures are breaks in bones. Common signs of these types of injuries include swelling, pain, and discoloration. Distinguishing the exact type of injury is often difficult. It is best to treat everything as a possible fracture. The limb may appear deformed, and the person may guard it by holding it against his body. Unstable bones or joints can damage surrounding tissue. Encourage the person to not move or use the injured limb. Just hold it as still as you possibly can. If the injury seems serious, or you are not sure, activate EMS. To activate the emergency action plan and bring me the first aid kit, please. Check to see if there is an open wound. Gently cut or tear away clothing to expose the injury site. Control any bleeding using a clean dressing and firm, continuous, direct pressure on the bleeding site. Do not push a bone back under the skin. Use padding in the gaps around it to provide a stable and comfortable spot for the limb to rest. If needed, place your hands above and below the injured area to help immobilize the limb. Local cooling can help decrease bleeding, swelling, and pain. It is best to not straighten an injured limb that is unnaturally angled. Leave the limb in the position found. If the limb becomes blue or extremely pale, circulation may be compromised by the injury. If you have not yet done so, activate EMS if this occurs. Splinting an injured limb can reduce pain and prevent further injury, especially when moving an injured person. In general, it is best to rely on EMS personnel to splint, as they have more extensive training, experience, and equipment. Comfort, calm, and reassure the person Reassess the person and injury regularly until EMS personnel take over. Hey, Russell, how's the order for my burgers coming? Oh, pretty good. Just a couple more minutes. Great, thank you. Mm-hmm. Behind you. A little bit more. A burn is an injury to skin and possibly underlying tissues caused by exposure to extreme heat, chemicals, or electrical contact. 
Common causes of thermal burns include direct contact with hot liquids, flames, or hot objects. Burns can also be caused by radiant heat from a hot environment or extended exposure to the sun. The severity of a burn is related to its depth and size. Deeper burns resulting in blistering or broken skin are more serious. Larger burns, even those with a shallow depth, are also more serious. Burn location contributes to severity. Burns involving the face, neck, hands, genitals, and feet can result in complications related to movement and other basic functions. Difficulty breathing as a result of inhaling hot air indicates a serious injury within the airway. All serious burns, or ones you are unsure about, should be evaluated by a healthcare provider. When a burn occurs, make sure the situation is safe for you to help. Act immediately to put the fire out. Direct the person to stop, drop, and roll. Smother the burning material with a coat, rug, or blanket or douse the material with water. Activate EMS if you think the burn is severe or you are unsure. Can you call 911? Yes. Mike, get the first aid kit. I can help. Okay. Let's go cool this down some more. Okay. Carefully expose burned areas by removing clothing. If needed, cut or tear clothing away. If it is stuck to the burn, cut around it. Cool a burn with cool or cold water as quickly as possible. Cool the burn for at least 10 minutes. Use a clean, cool, or cold dressing as an alternative when water is not available. Never use ice or a frozen compress to cool a burn. There are also burn dressings pre-soaked with a specially formulated gel to promote cooling of the burn. Early cooling can reduce pain and minimize the risk and depth of burn injury. When cooling large burns, watch for signs of overcooling, such as shivering. Children have a larger surface area in relation to weight than adults and are more likely to have complications from overcooling. Remove any jewelry near the burned area. Separate fingers or toes with sterile dressings or pads. To improve healing, leave any blisters intact. Loosely cover the burn area with a dry, clean pad or clean sheet to help keep it clean and protected. Avoid natural burn remedies such as honey or potato peels. Never apply butter, ointment, lotion, or antiseptic to a serious burn. Give the person nothing to eat or drink. Keep the person calm and comfortable while awaiting EMS. Medical emergencies involving electricity can occur when there is direct contact with an energized object, such as an electrical wire or outlet, or when someone is struck by lightning. Be safe. If you cannot stop the flow of electricity, do not enter the area around the person or attempt to care for her. Turn off any electrical current before okay. touching Power's the person. Off and locked out. It's okay to help now. An electric shock can cause an abnormal heart rhythm in which the heart stops moving blood. Hear me? When it is safe, perform CPR and use an AED if one is available. When a body part comes into contact with an exposed electrical source, electricity can travel from the point of contact to a second point of contact that is grounded. Common points of contact include the hands and feet. If the person affected is responsive and no longer in contact with the electrical source, look for burns at any suspected points of contact. Cool the burn as you would with a thermal burn. Cover with a clean, dry dressing. Consider seeking professional medical care because serious internal injuries can occur. and starting to burn. Some chemicals can damage skin tissue on contact. Take it easy. 
get it in there. The priority is to carefully and quickly remove the chemical to minimize any damage. While preventing any additional exposure to the injured person or yourself, immediately flood the affected area with large amounts of cool water, unless the chemical is known to react with water. Safely remove any contaminated clothing while continuing to flush the area. Flush with cool water for at least 20 minutes or until the pain is relieved. Cover any visible burns loosely with a dry, clean pad and seek further medical attention. When dealing with dry chemicals, carefully brush off any dry powder with a gloved hand or cloth without creating further exposure prior to flushing. Corrosive chemicals splashed into an eye can quickly damage eye tissue. Affected eyes will become painful and appear red and watery. Let me help, okay? We need to go rinse it out. Immediately flood the eye with large amounts of water. Carefully hold the eye open and flush continuously for at least 15 minutes or until EMS personnel take over flush outward from the nose side of the affected eye to prevent contamination of an unaffected eye. If the person is wearing contact lenses and they are not removed by the flushing, have the person try to remove them as flushing continues. If running water is not available, normal saline or another commercial eye irrigating solution can be used. Chemical burns to the eye require professional medical care. Call EMS. Activate EMS as quickly as possible. Without interrupting care, contact the Poison Helpline at 1-800-222-1222 for treatment advice when a chemical burn occurs. If not available, talk to the EMS dispatcher or a medical provider. I can help. Nosebleeds can occur when small blood vessels inside the nostrils are ruptured. Most nosebleeds are not serious and can be easily handled. To care for someone with a nosebleed, have her sit up straight with her head tilted forward, chin down. Pinch the soft portion of the nose with your thumb and index finger and hold it for about 10 minutes. Don't tilt the head back or have the person lie down. These actions may cause her to swallow blood and vomit. Have her spit out any blood that collects in her mouth. Monitor the person. If the nose continues to bleed or you see signs of developing shock, seek further medical help. A blow to the mouth can break, dislocate, or even knock out teeth. I think if we shuffle things around a little bit, we can uh, get that to you by next month. Okay, I'll let him know. All right, sounds great. I'm so sorry. Alan, are you okay? When a tooth oh, has been knocked God. out, treat it without delay. Immediate reimplantation is believed by the dental community to result in the greatest chance of tooth survival. Control any bleeding. Have the person gently bite down on a clean absorbent pad over the bleeding socket. Handle the tooth only by the chewing surface, called the crown. Do not touch the root, the part of the tooth that extends into the gum. Never scrub the tooth or remove any attached tissue fragments. Keeping the tooth moist can help extend the time for successful reimplantation. At a minimum, have the person spit into a cup and place the tooth in the saliva. Avoid storage in water. There are alternative solutions that are more effective for temporary storage of a displaced tooth than saliva. Hank's Balanced Salt Solution, egg white, coconut water, whole milk. Get the person to a dentist as quickly as possible, within an hour. The faster you act, the better the chance of saving the tooth. Medical conditions and illnesses can suddenly trigger an unexpected medical emergency. 
Good morning, Rick. How are you? Whoa, are you okay? I don't know. All of a sudden, I just feel awful. Okay, well, I can help. Is that okay? Tell me more about what... In general, suspect a serious illness when, without warning, a person suddenly appears weak, ill, or in severe pain. In many cases, the human body displays warning signs to alert us to serious illness. The most common warning signs of serious illness are an altered mental status, breathing difficulty or shortness of breath, and pain, severe pressure, or discomfort in the chest. Carl, are you okay? Let me help you, okay? Caused by a number of medical conditions, as well as the use of alcohol, medications, or drugs, an altered mental status is a significant or unusual change in a person's personality, behavior, or consciousness. It is an indication of a change in brain function. Carl, do you know what's going on? Regardless of the cause, an altered mental status is a warning sign of a serious problem and is considered a medical emergency. Activate EMS. Side parking lot. Uh, I need EMS right away. And can you send somebody out with first aid kit? Position the person for comfort. Calm and reassure him as best you can. If responsiveness becomes severely diminished, consider placing in a recovery position to protect the airway. Reassess regularly. The condition could deteriorate quickly and require additional care. Hey, are you ready to get something to eat? Yeah, I'm not having much luck with finding what I need. Ugh. Whoa. Fainting is a momentary loss of consciousness caused by an unexpected drop in blood pressure and blood flow to the brain. Anxiety, fear, pain, stress, standing in place too long, or rapid movements in position, such as standing up quickly from a seated or lying position, can all result in someone feeling faint or fainting. A medication or underlying medical condition might also contribute to the cause. If someone complains of suddenly feeling warm, lightheaded, or that his or her vision is narrowing, quickly lie her flat on her back on the ground. You can elevate the feet about six to 12 inches, which allows blood from the legs to move back into the body. Do not elevate the feet if it causes pain or you suspect a person may be injured. This is a temporary condition that should pass quickly and allow the person to get back to normal activities. A stroke or brain attack occurs when the blood supply to a portion of the brain is suddenly help. interrupted. Somebody, we need help. Sir, madam, I'm Ellen and I work for the winery. Is something wrong? I don't know what happened to him. I can help. A stroke most commonly occurs when a blood clot obstructs a blood vessel in the brain. A stroke can also occur when a weak spot in a blood vessel wall, known as an aneurysm, bursts open and bleeds into surrounding brain tissue. Signs of a stroke can vary depending on where the damage is located. The signs tend to show up suddenly. Numbness or weakness of the face, arm, or leg, especially on one side of the body. Confusion. A change in the ability to speak or understand. Changes in sight and balance. A severe, sudden headache. Early bystander recognition, along with rapid transport to a hospital, is critical for limiting damage or even survival. Medications are available at hospitals that can limit the severity of a stroke. The earlier they can be given, the better. A simple stroke assessment, such as FAST or FAST, helps decrease the time it takes to suspect a stroke, activate EMS, and get a person treated in a hospital. Sir, can you try and do a few things for me? F, okay. face droop. Ask the person smile to smile. If you can. Look to see if the smile is uneven. Good. Now, can you raise both of your arms? A, arm drift. Ask the person to raise both arms. Look to see if one drifts back down. Can you tell me your name? You S. Speech difficulty. Ask the person to speak a simple sentence. 
Listen for slurring or difficulty. Uh, T. I think we need time to activate EMS. Troy, go call 911. If the person has trouble with any of these tasks, activate EMS immediately. Report the time the person was last seen normal to EMS personnel. Overall, do not give anything to eat or drink. Be prepared for the possibility of sudden cardiac arrest and the need for CPR and the use of an AED. Stay close, calm, comfort, and reassure the person until another provider or EMS personnel take over. Diabetes is a disease in which the body cannot effectively use sugar for energy. Hypoglycemia, or low blood sugar, is a diabetic condition that can rapidly develop and become life-threatening. Early recognition and treatment by a first aid provider can prevent the condition from worsening. Hey, are you okay? No. I, I need to get started on this. I'm not sure how. Suspect hypoglycemia with anyone who begins to act oddly or becomes confused. The person may be trembling or shaking, and his skin may be pale, cool, and sweaty. If the person is unable to communicate clearly, look for a medical alert bracelet or necklace, which may help identify the underlying condition. You can also check with others about the person's medical history or medications he may be taking. If someone is unresponsive, unable to follow simple commands, or has difficulty swallowing, quickly activate EMS and provide any required supportive care. Do not give anything to eat or drink. Hey, Anna, can you come over here? Do you have your glucose with you? My coat. What's up? I think Jerry's having a problem with his diabetes. Can you run to the break room and grab his coat? He has some sugar tablets in one of the pockets. If the person is responsive and can swallow without difficulty, give about 15 to 20 grams of oral glucose tablets if they are available. If not available, use something with dietary sugar instead, such as orange juice, candy, fruit leather, or whole milk. Things that use artificial sweeteners will not help. It is important to note that insulin is not considered an emergency medication. It is never appropriate to administer insulin to a diabetic person in an emergency setting. Calm, comfort, and reassure the person. If he responds to the sugar, his mental status will gradually improve. If there is no response to sugar within 10 to 15 minutes, or the condition worsens, activate EMS and provide additional glucose or sugar. Reassess regularly until another provider or EMS personnel take over. Eduardo? Generalized seizures are triggered by excessive electrical activity within the brain. Eduardo! The result is uncontrolled muscle convulsions throughout the body. Hey! Somebody help! help! Typically, seizures happen without warning. Jerking movements of the body occur and breathing may seem absent. The person can lose control of his bowel or bladder and may vomit. I can help. While there are many things that can cause a seizure to occur, the care provided is always the same. Protect the person from injury during the seizure. Move objects away that he may bump into. Do not restrain the person. Allow the seizure to take its course. If possible, roll the person onto his side to allow saliva to drain from the mouth. Do not put anything in the mouth, including your finger. There is no danger of the tongue being swallowed. Has he had a seizure before? I, I don't think so. Go call for EMS and get the first aid kit and AED from the break room. Activate okay. EMS if the person is injured or vomits during the seizure, has no history of seizure, has multiple seizures, or continues to seize for more than five minutes. Most seizures last only a short time and will stop without any special treatment. Once stopped, place the person in the recovery position to protect the airway. If responsiveness and breathing are absent after a seizure stops, begin CPR and use an AED if one is available. Normally, once a seizure stops, responsiveness improves slowly over time. Provide continual reassurance as the person improves. Provide privacy to minimize embarrassment. 
Continue to monitor until EMS personnel take over care or the person returns to normal. 